No, it's my pleasure to be invited. You guys take it right to the wire, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But well, let me give you a quick introduction. People are just coming yeah. around here, so we'll be um, yeah. adding up quickly. But um, for those, uh, most people know Terry Linder, first, both nationally and internationally. But for those of you who don't, she's a um, board certified, a double board certified, both as a neonatologist and a child neurologist. She's a Mary Ellen Avery Professor of Pediatrics in the field of newborn medicine at Harvard Medical School and the first chair of the Department of Pediatric Newborn Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And this department was formed actually when uh, Terry arrived around 2016. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Terry. She is um, a very passionate clinician and researcher um, and her research and clinical work are deeply integrated um, with her clinical service in the NICU and overseeing um, the large and high volume NICU at the Brigham, you can tell that she is deeply motivated by the patients that she works with. Uh, she is really interested in improving the diagnosis, treatment and management of neonates in the NICU to prevent further injury and optimize long term outcomes, particularly those at highest risk for brain injuries, such as preterm neonates neonates with HIE and um, neonates with congenital heart disease. Um, as a result, a lot of her research focuses on understanding timing and mechanisms of injury as well as the impact of injury on brain development. Uh, she's a big believer and supporter of the use of technologies such as near infrared spectroscopy, electroencephalography, and magnetic resonance imaging in both clinical care and research. So it's really wonderful to partner with her um, around uh, the use of some of these technologies. And, she has the first in NICU MRI um, in, the, in North America. Um, the first one was in uh, Israel, but she's got the first one in North America, the Embrace Scanner, which we've been using now clinically. And it's, um, I think, been a really um, nice addition to the resources, particularly in this COVID time. So it's going to be really a pleasure for me to listen to Terry, as it always is. Um, she's an excellent speaker, and I'm sure we'll show, share some interesting thoughts around uh, neonatal brain injury and brain development. Thank you so much, Terry, for joining us. Thank you. So let me uh, share my screen and get things started. So hopefully uh, you guys can, oops, there we go. You guys can see my screen. All yep. good, Alan? Great. All good. Um, so I really thought about this and I thought that one of the things that might interest your group the most is just talk about where we're at and trying to improve outcomes in high-risk infants and what MR might have a role for as we start to move forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit really about the application and first of all the term infant with HIE in a very um, clinically relevant way rather than a more physiological or mechanism driven way per se and then around application in the preterm infant. So you all know MR has tremendous strengths in terms of its capacity to give good anatomical delineation and, and to have multiple complementary sequences. But for us, it, it is a challenge because when we take babies off the NICU for an MR uh, at a distance, there's always um, risk associated with that. And in fact, one recent article quoted somewhere around a 15 to 20% risk of something happening whether it was temperature instability or some other adverse effect from traveling off the unit. Um, it does require the infant to lie still, which in many places still means sedation. We're fortunate at Boston Children's and in our unit that we use a lot of wrapping techniques. And, you know, everywhere outside of our two groups and others, you know, often are not applying uh, the scanner with the sort of um, optimization that people like Borjan and, and Alan can bring to which sequences are going to be able to be optimized to get the best information relevant for what you're trying to look for. And then finally, it needs expert interpretation. And again, we're very fortunate to have Alan and Ed Yang, who will often read our scans, but around the country, there's often an adult neuroradiologist who may see a baby occasionally, who really isn't used to looking at the scans and um, may not have the experience to really understand what they're seeing. So what about these term babies with encephalopathy? What does this mean? These are babies who are born at full term. They come into the world on the day of birth um, and their parents are extraordinarily excited that this is gonna be the, the happiest day of their lives and something happens. And when the baby comes out, they don't cry. They may not breathe. They may not have a heart rate. And often we don't know why 
uh, we may not know. We may know the baby was showing some signs of stress prior to delivery, but we often don't know whether there's been a hemorrhage or whether there's been some other abnormality. And the baby will come out and need resuscitation by us. So we immediately will be there giving uh, support for breathing and heart rate and other things. But the question is, why did this baby, why is this baby encephalopathic? And encephalopathy is very hard to detect in a baby because unlike you on this sort of Zoom, I can't ask a baby, uh, are you orientated in person, place and time? You know, could you tell me uh, all about the latest election results? Um, they're really not cooperative with that. So, you know, the evaluation is much harder. And so fundamentally, if they're not moving, and they're not um, doing things like opening their eyes and looking around and being interested, then we regard them as, as impaired or encephalopathic. And we offer um, hypothermia treatment. We drop their body temperature for three days to 33 and a half degrees in a sophisticated blanket we wrap them in. And we do that if we think they're at any risk for brain injury. And it's been shown that that treatment in the setting of acute brain injury is associated with at least a 25% reduction in, uh, in death or disability, which is huge, it's huge. But we don't know, when we're sitting there, we've just resuscitated you, you're actually looking pretty good now, you're kind of perked up a bit. We have no idea whether you really had injury or not. And we have no idea whether we should put central lines in you and take your body temperature down for three days and give you morphine and do all sorts of horrible things to you. Um, and so, you know, how can we have a better way of understanding that? It's also uh, relevant that unfortunately in a litigious society that uh, these babies attract an enormous amount of attention because lawyers love to think that uh, they can go to battle yeah, against, against a, uh, an obstetrician and get you a big settlement of, and these cases on average settle for over $10 million dollars you know, a big settlement of which the lawyer gets a big chunk. Um, and so they like to be able to say everything would have been different if the baby had been delivered 20 minutes earlier. And so there's a lot of focus around timing. We need really uh, important guidance around sometimes whether we should be continuing ICU. Occasionally we have very profoundly severely affected babies. We have one at the moment in our unit um, that has a profound uh, brain injury. And you know, what should we be doing with that baby? Should we be continuing to ventilate and support or should we not? And how can we, how can we do that when often they may be very, very unstable? And then finally, the most relevant always is what, what really happened to this baby? Uh, did they really suffer any brain injury? What's the pattern of that brain injury? And what's the prognosis for the baby? Because these babies respond very favorably to rehabilitation if we know injury is there. This is the evolution of diffusion changes that we see in both uh, cooled and non-cooled babies that we studied when uh, I was in St. Louis. This is the data that had been previously established by Bob McKinstry and Jeff Neal, looking at the pseudo-normalization of the diffusion, the apparent diffusion coefficient. And on the y-axis here is the MD ratio. So this is comparing, because we know the apparent diffusion coefficient is different in different tissue types. So this is comparing for the same region what is the injured tissue showing us relative to normal? And what you can tell is that uh, in, the, in the first uh, 12 hours in particular, you may not see a lot of diffusion restriction, unlike adult stroke, right? You may not see that, that 20 minutes and bang, it's down. It's different because this is an ischemic reperfusion injury that we think is dominated by apoptosis as its form of cell death rather than necrosis. And because of that apoptotic timeline, uh, the visibility of the diffusion restriction may be slightly later in terms of when we really can visibly see it. So what we see is it peaks around day two to four, and then most of the time is pseudo-normalized really by day six to seven. Now, this is rare now because we call everybody. And when we call everybody, what happens? Well, the start of the curve isn't that different. Uh, what we see is still this, this uh, slightly difficult um, recognition of injury in the first 12 hours. But then between day two to four, we often see it being very low. But the tail is much longer, much longer. So even out around 10 days, we're still seeing visible restriction in the area of primary injury. This isn't areas of secondary injury. This is the area of primary injury. 
suggesting that we really did put this, uh, this cell death, the secondary cell death as we call it, on a slower trajectory uh, and a longer trajectory, opening up another window for us potentially of secondary neuroprotection that could be occurring after the day we rewarm, which is back here, right? We've rewarmed back here, but we've got all these days here where there's still something actively going on uh, that's reflected by the restricted diffusion. This was a, a series that was published by uh, you know, a legend in the field, Jim Barkovich from San Francisco early on, just looking at the typical evolution of the changes on the T1 imaging here and the apparent diffusion coefficient map here and the spectroscopy. And early at 16 hours, a little bit of visible restriction here, nothing on the T1, a little bit of visible restriction, but much more prominently seen on day four along with this elevation in lactate. And we don't know whether this baby was having seizures or not, but often we'll see that elevation in lactate occurring in the setting of uncontrolled seizures. And then here by day eight, you can see that this is pretty um, normalized, but now you can see quite prominent changes in the, in the T1. So that's been mapped out uh, somewhat beautifully in terms of this first 24 hour being a period that can be difficult uh, to, to detect imaging abnormalities, but then the diffusion, and then starting to evolve more into the conventional changes. Although we have to be careful because valerian degeneration is a secondary phase, will start to produce restrictions in the white matter tracts that, uh, that are attached to uh, dying neurons. As you know, there's a lot of challenges in diffusion imaging. Um, it's very hard to get high quality uh, imaging in these babies if they move at all. Um, we, we might be knowing when we're timing the imaging in terms of what day of life they are, but we don't know when the injury occurred. So how do you try to understand exactly what you're looking at? The nature of the injury may you make it easy or hard. The interpretation is subjective, although Alan's worked extremely hard to try and correct that. But still, most of the time we're looking for shades of gray, literally. And it may not reflect a reversible brain injury, particularly if the brain is metabolically stressed for whatever reason. This may be something that can fully reverse. Imaging guidelines were laid out in a, uh, an important document that was published by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology that suggested that head ultrasound may be useful to detect major malformations in a series that we studied of four and a half thousand babies with neonatal encephalopathy. Around 4% uh, actually had some abnormality in terms of a dysgenesis on the head ultrasound in the neonatal period that hadn't been picked up uh, on fetal ultrasound. CT should not be used. MR early, day one to four, might be useful for delineating injury and timing. But really the definitive imaging should be waited for uh, to after day seven, ideally more like day 10, because there is a little bit of a false negative on these early imaging. The patterns of injury we see in these kids commonly involve two types. One is the vulnerability of the deep nuclear gray matter because it's very metabolically active, so very vulnerable. And the second is the so-called watershed injury between the anterior and middle cerebral arteries or the middle and posterior cerebral arteries. And this is the type of abnormality you might see. This is one of our cases. These are the diffusion weighted images. Here you can see between the posterior and the middle and a little bit between the anterior and the middle. And then you can see not a lot here on the T1. And then by day 10, not really visible on the diffusion weighted but you can see a little bit of abnormality here on the T2, which may have been difficult to see without having been primed by the earlier imaging. Deep nuclear gray matter uh, injury is very significant for the babies if it's present. This is so-called mild, where you've just got this little area of injury in the lentiform, more significant thalamus and lentiform bilaterally and severe, very profound signal. The chordate, the head of the chordate up here is often spared it's unclear exactly why. It's probably not as metabolically active uh, or demanding. And so it's a good control area to look at. And the other thing we look at a lot is a so-called myelination in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, which is the main corticospinal tract. So you can see here coming down um, from the uh, supratentorial corticospinal area all the way down into the spinal cord. And it can be present beautifully like this impaired a little bit or fully absent. As you can see, it should be bright white and instead it's this gray. Uh, 
And this is again representation of what the posterior limb looks like fully myelinated compared to fully absent. Basal ganglia injury is very um, relevant because it's so prognostically powerful. When it is present, even in its mildest form, it significantly elevates um, the risk of cerebral palsy. And depending on whether that plaque is present or not present, there may be significant delays in walking. There are also significant challenges in feeding, speech and language, cognition, and we look at the cortex to evaluate seizures. If the, um, if the injury is more significant, uh, you can see here, then the, the rates of cerebral palsy now pretty uh, significantly rise. Uh, now talking about well over half of the children having some form of cerebral palsy and many more having uh, other types of disability. And when you get to severe basal ganglia injury, as I showed you, universally these children um, suffer from spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. So these are the children you'll often see who are wheelchair bound. Although cognition can be much harder to assess in these kids um, because their motor disability is so profound that it's difficult for them to be able to communicate effectively to evaluate it. But it really is profound uh, global disability. How good is MR at predicting these types of outcomes? Um, it's extremely good. It, whether you are called or non-called, um, the sensitivity and the specificity are actually very high as are the positive predictive value. You can compare this, say, for a chest X-ray and diagnosing pneumonia or a pleural effusion, which it's used for and no one would even question that it would be an accurate way of detecting a pleural effusion. And you can see that uh, the positive predictive value for MR for term encephalopathy is actually higher than that. The plick is also very powerful for motor outcomes. If you have an abnormal plick, you are likely to have an abnormal motor outcome. If your plick is normal, more than likely by a large amount, your outcome will be normal for motor outcomes. So where to with MR in this disorder? There's two things that I think MR really could move to try and help us with. And this is work that uh, we are doing some of with Alan now. The first is, we know that a lot of these babies, well, not all of these babies are injured in the immediate perinatal period, and this matters. The window for effectiveness with hypothermia is at best 12 hours, and it's probably very effective if it's the first six hours. But if this baby sustained injury 24 hours prior to delivery, hypothermia is probably not going to render any benefit at all. And that is relevant for one of the cases we have in the unit. So we see very bad babies come out who had an immediate abruption and they may have a pH that's 6.7 and a look terrible and, and be in cardiac arrest. And, you know, the world is just terrible. And if we get them called straight away, we can see literally no brain injury in those kids. There's other babies who come out who don't look so bad. And yet uh, we know as we image them on day four, they've got profound brain injury. And really we have to believe that some of that occurred um, in, a, in a time window that wasn't gonna to respond to hypothermia. Why is that important? Because we've got other treatments now that are coming. So stem cells are very close to being available now. They are being manufactured now in North Carolina um, in an allogeneic form. They will be available to use in these babies but we can't use them with hypothermia. We're gonna to have to choose between hypothermia and stem cells, or we're gonna to have to wait. So we'll give hypothermia to everybody, and then we won't give the stem cells till day four or five, because they seem to negate each other. There are also other types of neuroprotectants that are coming, oxysterols, erythropoietin, um, and, and which baby is really gonna benefit? A lot like the adult stroke work which of the treatments should be targeted to which patient. And I really believe if we could image these kids early, and if we saw injury that was present, that was very clearly visible, particularly prominent diffusion abnormalities, we could at least know that it's unlikely that this occurred in the last six to 12 hours. So how easily can we get these kids to the scanner in the first few hours of life? Does injury even exist? If it does, when was the timing? What was the outcomes? How can we get better at all of those things? And these are really the ways of taking away from um, using the maps that Helen has been developing or other types of machine learning where you're not relying on this 
uh, subjective read from the radiologist, but you've really got a better way of taking all of the information from the scan, helping to uh, put it into a clinically relevant tool that can help with prognostication of likely impact. For later imaging, after those first uh, few days of life, really we want to be able to understand how long this window of neuroprotection is and what other treatments we should be giving. And I, myself with Alan, and working uh, funded by the Hood, doing a serial study where we're imaging these kids day four, day 10 to 14, uh, four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. And it's been striking to me to see how much change is still going on even six weeks after birth, after when I would have thought injury was done and dusted, we are still seeing quite a variation in either the primary injury or the impact of that injury on subsequent connectivity and, and development. How does the injury you know, really evolve? And, and can we do even better if we get imaging, say at 12 weeks, using resting state functional connectivity to prognosticate outcome and direct rehabilitative input? So that's a lot of where imaging is gonna go, I think it could take us, and that's the challenge of how to use the tools you've got to help us with that. When we turn to the preterm, it's even a little more complicated. And that's because it's become a, um, it's become a little bit of a hot potato. In the preterm, we know that prognosis is related to accurate recognition of both brain injury and brain development. These kids are undergoing, as we'll see, a dramatic period of brain development, and how can we use MR to help us to define that? Here's an example of a baby who underwent an MRI in one of our studies, actually. This was a baby who was born at 29 weeks, nearly three pound, had an uh, early rupture of membranes by the mother, which was one of the reasons she went on and delivered prematurely. The baby developed some respiratory difficulties, was intubated and received surfactant, but extubated at less than 24 hours of life. So really benign in our terms. I mean, hardly would even get me to sort of work up a, 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 even a mild um, interest on rounds because there was no hypertension, no sepsis. This baby had nothing bad. Was on full feeds on day of life five and grew well and was getting ready to go home at 3.8 kilos. The cranial ultrasounds that were done on day of life three, seven, and 28, which are our standards, were completely unremarkable. And this baby had an MRI research study at term equivalent. And on that research study, we detected, here's the ultrasound here that was unremarkable. We detected this area of punctate um, signal abnormality that happened to lie right in line with that posterior limb of the internal capsule coming up to the cortex. So despite the fact the rest of the brain looks actually pretty good, uh, this scar or glial scar, which is what we believe it is, lying in line with the corticospinal tract does have implications for hypertonicity and impairment in motor development, which can be uh, favorably um, modified by physical therapy. So uh, here is our little friend, baby A. And um, after the MRI result, he was referred to neurology and physical therapy with more aggressive early intervention. He came back at four months and this was his developmental evaluation. And the only area that he was impaired on was his fine motor development. And the concerns that were noted was that the feet were not flat, flat and standing. Um, so, you know, we really uh, put more effort after that into more work on his uh, lower motor tone because otherwise these kids aren't picked up until after their toe walking at 18 months or even later. Often people say, well, that's great, Terry, you do the MR and you, you think you're detecting some injury, but, you know, who knows whether early intervention even makes a difference and it's cool because we don't call it rehabilitation, we call it early intervention. So early intervention programs have actually been shown, and this is the Cochrane Review data, to have a positive influence on cognitive and motor outcomes during infancy, and those cognitive benefits appear to per persist right into preschool age. There's a lot of variation around which therapies are given and more research is needed, but it makes sense that this is a period of brain development where they could really um, benefit from that early impact. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, don't do an MRI in the neonatal unit, Terry, wait until the child has some difficulties and then do your MRI. 
And for all of us who know what it's like to put these very busy uh, toddlers into the MRI scanner, um, I say uh, good luck with that. Um, I would much rather put this little guy down in the scanner than try to be chasing these people um, into the scanner. So to me, you're trying to prevent disability as well, not diagnose disability. Because if we could risk stratify, then it would help, right? We could risk stratify you as high or low and target your rehab program after discharge. But despite that, um, even within our local uh, neighborhood, um, one of the leading voices nationally about MR um, as a negative, um, negative tool has been the Beth, Beth Israel team. So why is it getting negative press? Why do people think MR shouldn't be done in these babies? It's really because a lot of places rapidly started doing MRs when they weren't really well set up. There's been a lot of human miscommunication or the physicians don't feel well um, prepared to be able to talk to families about the findings from the MR. We have a lot of paternalism because we don't want our parents to be anxious. We want to prevent them from any more uh, stress or harm. And we think if we find brain injury, if we don't look, we won't find it. And if we find it, it's only going to cause anxiety. And, and what does it mean anyway? A fear of what we might find and what to do with it and a finding a lot of abnormalities in our unit. Like what happens if we image all the babies in our unit and they're all bad? Then what does that mean about what I'm doing here? Um, and then there's the thing that's thrown at us all the time is the cost accountability. Why add more cost uh, to the care? One of the pivotal uh, articles that came out was a, an article that came from Canada, actually, and was published in Europe about um, this baby who was twin, she was one of twins born to, um, to two very highly educated PhD parents at 25 weeks. She had a very stressful NICU course because her twin sister died in the neonatal intensive care unit. And in this unit at that time, MRI was undertaken uh, at discharge as routine care for all infants less than 26 weeks. Now, the real problem with this was no one told her parents that she was going to get an MRI and why she was going to get an MRI. And they came in to see her uh, in the afternoon and she wasn't in her room. Uh, she was down in the MRI scanner. And uh, they were like, well, why is she getting an MRI? Like, what's gone wrong? And they were like, no, 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 we just do it routinely. And then her head ultrasounds throughout her stay had been unremarkable. And on her MRI, a moderate cerebellar hemorrhage was diagnosed for the first time. And when the baby came back from the MRI scanner, they were told that information by a provider without any context or support or a real you know, touchdown. Went immediately home and went to Dr. Google about moderate cerebellar hemorrhage and said, saw that it was associated by Kathy Limperopoulos's work with autism and they became very, very distressed. So they uh, wrote this saying, you know, some parents would prefer to remain blissfully ignorant, especially if there's nothing medically tangible that they can do. Now their daughter is doing very well and she received, because of this diagnosis of moderate cerebellar hemorrhage, additional rehabilitation services in addition to what she would have. And um, that's often, unfortunately, not uh, part of the story. So sometimes parents and providers just would rather not look, see, hear, and certainly don't want to talk about it. Um, but what are other data is out there to guide us? Well, there was this nice study done in the UK where they randomized over 500 babies to have both an MRI and an ultrasound, a term equivalent. But they only told the parents the results of one of the studies, and they randomized them. You either got the results of the MRI or the results of the ultrasound. And the primary outcome was maternal anxiety uh, levels that were measured before the imaging visit, two weeks after, um, and then 12 months after, and then uh, 18 to 24 months later. And what did they find? So this is their measure of anxiety. What they found at 12 months was the parents in the MRI group had lower anxiety than the parents in the ultrasound group. Now, is this measurably significant of an importance? Well, it is because everybody thinks the MR is gonna cause anxiety. And in fact, what the parents reported, and there was a lot of qualitative research, was that their, um, their feeling was that they had more information and it reduced their anxiety.
So it didn't seem to make things worse. It did seem to reduce anxiety. It did improve uh, motor prediction in particular, better than ultrasound, although neither were very good at predicting cognitive outcomes, at least with the scoring system they used. And a single MR in their hands was around 300 pound more. But often I hear, well, what does it really show? So here are two 23 week gestation infants who are now term equivalent. So they're now 40 weeks. They're both ready to go home from the hospital. They've been with us for 17 weeks. They both have cost well over a million dollars in care, well over a million dollars, some approaching 2 million. And this is the MRI that is being done the week they're going home from the hospital. And what you can see are very different brains, right? Now, neither of them were said to have significant IVH. Neither of them were said to have white matter injury because they had no cysts. But there's a lot of difference between these two brains in the way that the brain has grown, has, has developed and, and folded in, in any sophisticated way. And in terms of, um, you know, this ex vacuo expansion, you can see there's a lot more impairment. I'm a lot more worried about this guy than I am about this. So what are the roles that MR can play in trying to understand how to um, better guide the clinician who's taking care of these babies, both in terms of understanding, we've, we've made no impact in improving neurodevelopmental outcomes in our pre term in the last 20 years, no improvement at all. And part of it has been because we haven't been able to reduce brain injury, but it's also because we haven't paid attention to other types of alterations in brain development. So let's start with brain injury. What role does MR have in that? Well, it can define the presence and the severity, and particularly the extent of any parenchymal involvement. And this is very important for a very common lesion we have, intraventricular hemorrhage. It can also help us if there is a complication with intraventricular hemorrhage, which is where they develop hydrocephalus about when to intervene. And, and for the future, as I say, just like for the term baby, we are pretty close to having stem cells. And there's a number of trials going on now with anti-inflammatories, because one of the areas of the brain that is injured um, and is very sensitive is the white matter. And this is particularly injured in the setting of sepsis or neck with neuroinflammation. It also could, um, as we said, really help us with what kind of neurorehabilitative therapies, stem cells, growth factors, and also therapy. And that is really by the prognosis at discharge targeting that. So interventricular hemorrhage, this is a beautiful uh, piece of data from the Neonatal Research Network, 35,000 babies that came from 26 centers, analyzed over a 20-year period. Although... We go down to 22 weeks now, more and more of our tiny babies are surviving. The risk of a major intracranial hemorrhage, um, which is, uh, is about, for these babies, less than, 32, less than 32 weeks, less than 28 weeks, it would be around 30 to 40% of these babies will have some form of intracranial hemorrhage. But as you can see here, if you're down at 22 to 23 weeks, it's around 50%. And really over this whole time, We've made literally no inroads in reducing the risk, even though we've increased a protective factor giving maternal antenatal steroids, and we've become less aggressive in the type of care we provide to these babies by trying to have our hands off them more and do less to them. But despite that, we've really not been able to reduce this um, common form of brain injury. And here it is, uh, here you can see this is a classic evolution a little bit of a germinal matrix hemorrhage here. The germinal matrix sits right in the cordothalamic groove uh, here in the edge of the ventricle. It's a delicate network of uh, capillaries with a semi-venous architecture, and so they're very prone to rupture. They produce interneurons that were meant to migrate into the cortex, and the mig migration of those are obviously impaired if you uh, disrupt and destroy the germinal matrix. But in addition, it bleeds and it bleeds into the ventricles. And if you get enough blood in the ventricle, you will obstruct the draining vein here and have a secondary venous hemorrhagic infarction in the, uh, in the hemisphere, as you can see here, where the, the uh, blood here filling the ventricle will be enough to obstruct the terminal vein coming down. And that will lead to obstruction to these medullary veins, which rupture, causing a parenchymal stroke. 
Not all of these are the same though. And often on ultrasound, you'll hear somebody say, oh, I think there's a grade four and the whole nursery will go quiet. Uh, people will feel very sad and people will start talking about taking the baby off the ventilator. But just like any stroke, there's different types of strokes and different sizes and different severities. And these are three babies that all have so-called grade four hemorrhage. You can see this is a very small focal parenchymal lesion, medium size and a much bigger parenchymal lesion. So, you know, this can be much more easily delineated um, as well as for me, the other important correlate of this is that the, the cerebellum also has a germinal matrix and that is also vulnerable to rupture and hemorrhage in the same way. And there's a, a tight correlation between supratentorial and infratentorial hemorrhage. And if there is involvement of the cerebellum as well, the prognosis for this baby becomes much, much worse. Linda DeVries has beautifully followed up the largest number of kids with these grade four hemorrhages with very good delineation by MR. And because we universally often think of these as just terrible lesions, what she has shown is most of these lesions are isolated in the parietal lobe. For those children who survive, which already is you know, only about 60%, the risk of cerebral palsy is 50%, but the vast majority of it close to 75% is just in the upper limb. It's just tightness in the upper limb and maybe work that needs to be done to improve dexterity. But it is not what we saw with the basal ganglia lesions where we saw these profound multi-dimensional disabilities. Cerebellar hemorrhage, you can see here a large one on ultrasound, but sometimes it can be very difficult to see anything on ultrasound. And we know much more readily detected on MR. In the uh, best cranial ultrasound studies, between two to eight percent of preterm infants had this kind of lesion. But when you do the routine MRI, you'll see it in closer to twenty percent of the babies. And particularly, these smaller hemorrhages are really only detectable on MR. Cerebellar hemorrhage, if the hemorrhage is large, is often associated with significant developmental delay, um, and particularly in the domain of autism. But with smaller hemorrhages, it's yet unclear and there may be a mild increase mainly in motor disability. The commonest lesion by far is actually white matter abnormalities because the naked wires within the cerebral uh, cortex coming from the gray matter down to the deep gray matter or crossing between neuron to neuron are uninsulated, unmyelinated, very sensitive and vulnerable. And this is what it looks like, as we saw earlier, these punctate lesions, these little punctate spots. Here, a few more of them. Here, linear scarring, or here, the old, very severe cystic form. So if brain injury is accounting for most of the difficulty these kids are having, we should be able to untangle that. And we looked at that by classifying brain injury uh, across these three common forms of brain injury in a very large cohort of premature infants in relationship to their outcomes. And what we found was out of our 320 premature infants, 220 of them didn't have any form of brain injury in terms of these three major forms, but they still had a low IQ, a whole standard deviation lower than it should have been. And they still had a significant risk of intellectual disability and even cerebral palsy. Definitely when they had high grades of brain injury, which is still fortunately relatively rare in this very large cohort, uh, their risks of significant disability went up. But again, this is a very small number of kids out of the 320. And overall, the other kids with brain injury didn't deviate much between those with brain injury or without. They were all off. They were all bad. We know for motor outcome in particular, the MRI is much, much more um, sophisticated in predicting. And this has been shown across a vast number of studies. But despite that, as I say, uh, led out by the Beth Israel was this article called Choosing Wisely, which stated findings on term equivalent MRI correlate with neurodevelopmental outcomes at discharge and two years of age. There is, however, insufficient evidence that the routine use of term equivalent or discharge screening MR improves long-term outcome. They quoted cost, and again, as I told you, this is an average 28-weeker. This is their average cost of stay. This is what an ultrasound costs. And this is what an MR costs. 
This is less than a day in the NICU for a baby who has cost us this. I believe their brains deserve that and we need it. In contrast to the Choosing Wisely campaign, uh, Donna Ferrero came out with a wise choice response, stating that the Choose Leading Wisely publication concluded there is insufficient evidence that routine use of the MR improves outcome. Unfortunately, the authors are confusing prediction and outcome. No one is claiming that a diagnostic scan, a scan can improve outcome, but rather that performing the scan allows one to decide on necessary interventions. Therefore, despite the well-intentioned guidelines by the Choosing Wisely campaign, the preterm newborn who is at high risk of brain injury should have proper documentation of their brain status by MR prior to discharge from the neonatal intensive care unit. And you'll be pleased to know that uh, Alan and I continue this um, flight uh, with another commentary that we are currently both involved in writing with Donna to try and inform um, the neonatal audience about why they need to know how the brains of their babies look because they can differentiate between the risk for these two infants. And they can do that by using scales such as this one that we uh, had the privilege of developing that just looks at markers of injury as well as growth and development for the white matter, the cortex, the deep gray matter and the cerebellum. And we've shown these scores scored at term equivalent relate to outcomes seven years later that high scores are associated with impaired performance and particularly in the areas of the deep nuclear gray matter in the cerebellum. You can also look at the performance of your unit. We compared a unit in the Netherlands with the unit in St. Louis, uh, and we showed that the unit in St. Louis uh, had higher scores overall, but in particular, uh, there was differences in where the high scores were seen. So you could see that uh, some of the white matter scores were significantly higher in the St. Louis cohort. So you can start to understand what's going on in your unit. We know that brain, um, that brain growth can also be tracked by MR. And when we do serial studies, which Ellen and I are both involved in doing now uh, here in Boston, we can be able to track brain growth. And Lillian Matthews, who some of you know, was able to publish this data of over 20 preterm infants looking at brain growth over the postmenstrual age by serial scanning in the same infant. And you can see that the trajectory of brain growth isn't completely linear, that it actually takes a little bit of a sort of trajectory of enhanced rate of brain growth from 34 weeks to term. And this is a real opportunity for us to try and optimize that, that brain spurt in that last six weeks. We know brain growth requires energy um, and that there's a lot of brain growth going on during this period, but we also know that we don't do a good job of providing the energy, that inadequate nutrition is very common. And if you look at the percentage of our babies that have extra uterine growth retardation, we call it, you can see that between 65 to 55% of our babies are less than the 10th centile, and about a third of them are less than the third centile. So there should only be 3% down here, and we've got about 33%. There should only be 10% down here, and we've got over 50%. So we have a lot of work to do still in trying to optimize nutrition, because there's some good data that show that's being carried out by Mandy Belford-Brown now and Catherine Bow here, that the amount of energy intake uh, and protein intake really has been shown to correlate with both brain volumes and measures of brain development using diffusion imaging. And this also relates to effects of breast milk, which are slightly different in terms of maternal breast milk and where its effect is seen both early at the time of discharge and even all the way into adolescence when we look at later outcomes. Brain growth can be monitored and can be uh, monitored by MR. And there are several things we know that are affected already. We've shown that some of the negative exposures, such as opiates affecting cerebellar growth, negative and positive experience, we'll talk about briefly in a minute, and nutrition. As we talked about, Mandy's group have shown that low breast milk exposure and low uh, lean mass relative to fat mass, so low protein uh, intake and low lean mass, really doesn't, um, is, is associated with poor brain growth. We can track the cortical surface development of the brain using cartographic techniques to look for gyral folding patterns. This is one baby from 25 weeks to 37 weeks. 
We can compare what our babies look like going home from the hospital compared to healthy term babies. We can also compare healthy term babies to the adult brain. We know that if we look at a healthy term baby going home from the hospital today upstairs at the Brigham, that unfortunately our preterm population, and this is still the case, going home from our NICU do not look like this. And this was five uh, premature babies that we started uh, applying this technique to who were going home at Wash U, um, who were term equivalent. None of them had significant brain injury. So they had not had significant IVH, white matter injury, or cerebellar hemorrhage. And yet their brain development is still not normal. You can see these areas, particularly around the temporal lobes, that are very, very impaired. And in fact, when we were able to put 54 of those brains without injury together into one atlas and compare it to 24 healthy controls, the areas that were definitely different highlighted around the superior temporal sulcus and here in the sort of dorsal prefrontal area. And you can see that these areas were different because they were shallower and they were simpler in their formation along the temporal lobe. You might say, Cherry, give them a bit of time, they'll catch up. So we looked seven years later in a preterm population. It didn't matter whether you were born in St. Louis or in Melbourne, Australia. The difference between prematurely born kids and full-term kids is very uh, prominent along the superior temporal sulcus region. So this area is uniquely vulnerable during development to impairment. And it's also been shown to be present in the cardiac, congenital cardiac population. We see it whether we look at social depth maps. Uh, we also see it in the volumetric differences. And we know that these volumetric differences, when we've looked at the relationship to performance metrics, we can see that reductions in volumes in these regions relate to language performance, attentional performance, and other things. So if we know that the temporal lobe is altered, and we know it impacts long-term outcome, and we know it's independent of injury, even though we want to prevent injury and fix injury, what is driving that? And we had somebody look at the impact of neonatal stress on outcome. And what she showed was that on average, our babies are having between 10 and 12 painful procedures a day. And that even after you control for how sick they are, how small they are, all the other things that are going on to them, that more stress particularly associated with painful procedures, but also just stress and handling, was associated with impairment in both frontal and temporal lobe development. This has been shown for pain as well, specifically in terms of impairment in somatic growth and development and cortical activation, brain development, and other types of metrics for brain development. So if our babies are really suffering and you can see it on imaging and you can see it in outcomes, why don't we, you know, keep them comfortable, give them some medications to prevent them feeling uncomfortable? Well, we looked at this with morphine and in Australia, only about 25% of our babies get any uh, type of pain relief. And what we found was that at term equivalent, those babies did have slightly smaller volumes, but at seven years, it was no different. At two, the morphine-exposed children showed a bit of behavioral dysregulation, but seven years later, no difference. So we didn't find any big impact, either protective or uh, associated with poor outcomes. However, then this work came out from Stephen Miller's group in Toronto, and what he showed was that the exposure to morphine was strongly associated with impairment in cerebellar growth, and that that impairment related to poor neurodevelopmental function. And this was particularly relevant for the smallest babies. But if you look here, his scale is semi-logarithmic. So we moved from Australasia, which was uh, opiates were not used very much, to North America, where they were used more liberally. If you look at where our dose was in Australia, it was right here, right in the middle here. So hence, we didn't see any effect. Whereas with larger doses in the North American context, we did. We also saw this in St. Louis, another North American cohort, where fentanyl was the main uh, opiate that was used to try and sedate the babies, and all of them just about got it, and they got a lot of it. And we found both an increased risk of cerebellar hemorrhage and impairment in cerebellar growth. And this is particularly because the cerebellum is laden with these opiate mu receptors. 
So if our babies are stressed and we don't want to give them opiates because we don't, then what else could we do? And we said, oh, we're renovating our unit and we're going to turn it into these beautiful hotel facility rooms. Surely it'll be less stressful in there. So let's study that. And luckily we had still our open bay unit uh, that was open and babies were randomly, totally randomly as they came in assigned to either the beautiful hotel suite or the open YMCA dorm. And they stayed there the entire time so that uh, the parents could visit, everything else was the same, same docs, same nurses, but they were just in a different room environment. And we said, look, I'd rather go to the Hilton. I'd rather go to the Hilton and the Y. I'm gonna be so much less stressed and my brain's gonna develop so much better. So we followed the kids up till they were two and we accounted for any uh, injury that was present, any severity of illness, even though they weren't different between the two groups because they were totally separate groups. But we also looked at social risk and family functioning in the group. And what did we find? We found that those that were in the private room actually had lower language performance than those in the open bay, the opposite of what we expected. We expected that the kids in the open bay were going to do worse because they were all in this chaotic environment and that the kids in the single room were going to be all happy and less stressed. And what we found specifically for language was not that. So then we looked at the brains and we know your brain, when I flip top it, is not the same between the right and left hemisphere. Then on the right, you can see this deeper area in the red, which is associated with facial recognition. And in the blue, it's deeper on the left, associated with language. And we said, well, that's great, David Van Essen, for adults, but that's not going to be present for babies because they haven't seen a face yet and they are not really giving us a lot of language uh, verbal output. And we were wrong. The infant brain has already got all of these hemispheric asymmetries in place emphasizing how important the foundational piece of pregnancy and the building of the, the infrastructure for the total, um, you know, your total lifelong journey. What did we find was the impact of the two room environments? Well, look at the open bay. Hemispheric asymmetries aren't perfect, but they're trying, trying. Single patient room, not present at all. The room environment you were being reared in during this 12 week period affected your structural brain development. When we looked at it with Alina, a device to be able to measure what was going on in the environment, you can see a lot of silence in the single private room. A lot of time there's no human being in there talking. In the open bay, a lot of noise. That's what we don't like, a lot of noise, but also a lot of voice. The blue is all human voice. This is nursing handover. Oh, Johnny's been a bit unsettled today, but oh, did you see the finish of the crown? That was quite interesting. A lot of chitter chatter going on and that's what they need to be able to develop the auditory cortex language center that is not present when they are in the isolated single room. This has been further studied by Bobby Pineda, really looking at systematic differences both for silence being much commoner in the private room and distant words being less frequent. And the big key to all of it was really parent presence and holding. That was the thing that really drove the language exposure in both environments. Alan Job wrote an editorial associated with our primary paper saying that these babies now were at a risk of sensory deprivation, similar to what was studied by Harry Harlow in the 50s. And we know that this is true, that they need more than just auditory input because they, uh, they have to be able to have the feeling and the presence of nurturing. And this has been shown by a lovely Israeli study where they're randomized to just one hour of kangaroo care a day for 14 days. And it's been shown to have a persisting improvement in cognition, half of which is due to a better parent-infant interaction and half of which is not. So if our parents are part of the key, why aren't they there? Uh, we interviewed, or Leanne Woodward interviewed 300 uh, families across the Harvard network. And guess what she found? Nearly uh, two thirds of our mothers have some form of significant psychological distress and over a third of our fathers. And this is mainly anxiety, depression, or PTSD. We also know that in our environment, we so-called, uh, disempower our parents 
The original incubator was called the isolate to isolate the baby from the risk of infection, particularly from the mother. And uh, although uh, this is from the lying in in the black and white with the nurse there, and um, you can see the funnel. So feeding technology has moved forward. We now have a syringe pump. Um, but you can see that the incubator itself doesn't look very different, right? The technologies have not moved forward. So really, um, oh, to be able to uh, think about brain development um, in the, in the preterm, oh, I don't know why it wants to do that. Um, let's see if it'll... I don't know, we'll see if we can do it this way. Sorry, I don't know why it does not want to advance. Um, here we go. We have to accept that major brain injury is common and that it may have a secondary dismaturational effect. But most importantly, I want to leave you that environment and exposures matter for this period. And we need to work a lot on reducing negative experiences and improving positive experiences and advocating for parent presence. And we're only gonna do that by studying brain development with MR and showing how powerful it is as a tool to show the, the impact. Parent mental health and empowerment and attachment are also powerful. And we need to continue to research the under, underlying biological mechanisms. There's a lot of data now to suggest the microglia is the key. And this may have lifelong effects, particularly for aging. So very finally, if you're gonna improve the uh, preterm infant, unlike the term infant, there's a lot going on here over many, many weeks. The first week of life is really overwhelmed by this form of brain injury. We really need brain monitoring with the neuroinfrared type tools that Alan has been dedicated to developing. But then the next 10 to 12 weeks or longer, that baby is living with us, undergoing extensive brain development, which is influenced by negative experiences, positive experiences and nutrition. And we need to fight for improvement in our technologies, improvement in, in the types of exposures and experiences, improvement in parent presence and empowerment and improvement in nutrition. And finally, just as you uh, all need to be taken care of it because we want you to continue your passion and your investigative prowess for us. We need to take care of all of the caregivers who are both in the NICU and in the investigative teams to be able to really make this story happen because we've all had a very challenging time. So with that, um, I think I turn back to believing that you can, but we're only halfway there and that's okay because it's fun along the journey when you've got friends like you guys. So with that, I know it was a whirlwind of a tour, but I hope that it left you with something that excited you, that uh, told a clinical impact for the type of work you do. Thank you very much. Harry, thank you. That was just an awesome presentation as always. Really wonderful overview of how imaging and care and how what we do could working together. There are so much possibilities. So I, I thought that was just amazing talk. Thank you so much. Um, I could go on for questions for ages, but I would first like to give the opportunity for anybody else to ask questions. Of course, I have a question. <laughs> um, actually, I have two questions. Um, so first question is linked to neuroimaging. Like you said, um, MRI and low rate of success improving the outcomes. Um, and like, how do we incorporate the routine use? How useful it is? Um, so we know that like there are a lot of transient structures in the human brain. I guess this question is going to be very obvious. And we know that like just changing a flip angle or time to a whole, we can kind of elucidate and see better some of those structures. Um, like in the last 10 years, whoever I spoke with tended to use like standard sequences that would develop a long time ago. Um, so I'm kind of just trying to ask where we at in terms of trying to integrate structures that we know they are there, but we're still not able to see them like very clearly with the current sequences that we are using for trying to predict or plan the, 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 the treatments or interventions in prematurely born babies. Um, I did try to do like kind of a version of the scoring, but it ended in a huge discussion where like a lot of people from different professions get in and you end up like 
leaving the discussion because it gets to, okay, is it really there? Who can see it? Who cannot see it? How objective that is? So it, it tends to be very, very, it, it needs a lot of energy and a lot of convincing uh, from different groups. So that's first question. And the second question is just linked with the delivery of stem cells. Um, and just like, there is a lot of, like one talk that I saw was linked to um, like people, they were trying, I think from Hungary, they were trying to deliver them um, in ventricles, which I found like pretty odd because like at the time prematurely born babies are born, like a majority of neurons are there in the cortex and the white matter already has this like architecture where navigating from ventricles to like mm -hmm. white matter or cortex would be very hard for the stem cells. So I don't know what are the advances in that field. So let me answer the second question first. So most of the trials that that I'm involved in are all intranasal administration um, of stem cells. And the stem cells themselves may not live, right? They, prob they probably don't live. But what they do is, uh, particularly in the setting of injury, they'll migrate to the area of injury. We can see that very prominently. And they produce a milieu by a neuroendocrine stimulatory effect that um, promotes regeneration. And we actually see that, and I studied it in my Doris Duke actually, we see the subventricular zone change in kids with injury, becomes kind of a dense band, and it's often got a radial orientation on diffusion that when we look at it in the baboon, we can see those are all, um, you know, newly generated cells that are multi, um, multi-dimensional in terms of being astrocytes, glia, neurons. They've all been born the, the, the subplate's still very active down there, especially if it's stimulated by injury. So what you're trying to do by stem cells is really uh, further uh, enhance that. So you're not trying to necessarily get them to migrate to actually connect to do other things. But a lot more work needs to be done in that area. So, um, and they may need other things with them. They may need the growth factors and they may need the cortical stimulation and they may need the other things. In terms of the first question, I think it's fabulous. I mean, we, we have not progressed in the way we should have in the last 10 years in terms of acquisition, post-processing and interpretation. So if we were really good at this, we would have really worked out what we want to do with our acquisitions. But acquisitions, apart from getting maybe slightly higher resolution and not even that much higher resolution, you know, really haven't move to get the sort of types of what are the features we are trying to optimize to really bring out the post-processing you know we've got a little better at the automated pipelines but i mean we seem a bit stuck to be honest uh in terms of integrating and for me one of the biggest challenges i would love somebody to answer is the brain is a system it's not a volume it's not a diffusion map it's not even a resting blood flow activation. It's a system. It's a complex integrated system that's constantly moving and, and, and using different components in an integrated fashion. And we don't capture that by any of our current methods of analysis. We, we regionalize. We, we, we focus, we, we go down in one thing and we, we say, well, you're, you're the amygdala, you have to be involved in this. And, and we don't think about what's going on in the rest of the network. It's kind of like asking your child to be doing really well on the exam, on their desk, on their computer, when the rest of the household is burning down. But, you know, we're only worried about your, who's at the desk. So, you know, we need a lot more sophisticated machine learning techniques to look at the whole system and to be able to understand how this integration happens. And that hasn't happened. And then, you know, finally, image, it's, it's ridiculous. One, imaging should not be said to affect outcomes. You know, if I take an image, I'm not going to alter your outcome today. If I take a photo of you, I'm not going to alter your outcome. What I'm going to do is inform something that may alter what I do with it, might, might alter, you know, I just went to my primary care this morning. She gave me my risk of having significant cardiac disease in the next 10 years. Does she really, and you know, I mean, what is that good for? Well, it's good for, oh, should you think about whether you should have something for statins or should you have this or should you have this or should we be focusing on more? You know, I mean, they're going to delineate what they want to do. And that's all we're doing with MR. But 
could we be using clinical information alongside imaging information, alongside a neurobehavioral evaluation? Why aren't we taking these pieces of information in a precision medicine sort of approach to bring the clinical and imaging domains together to help? Uh, thank you. Uh, but just to link it to the, what you just said, like, did you maybe notice like parents who had MRI of babies, did they change their behavior like towards neonates that they took home? Maybe that kind of affected the outcome at least a little bit. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't think we've systematically studied it. I'm always interested in which parents don't want to have an MRI and how much uncertainty they're left with and how they live with that. Um, but yeah, does it reassure them? I can tell you, I, I think there is an art form in the way you talk to talk the parents through the scan and what it means. And we haven't done a good job of training others. I'm, I'm trying here now to do that. But, um, but it, you can really empower the parents with the information, even if the information is not great news, at least you're then supporting them with a team to help, help them process that and, and move forward. Otherwise they turn up two years later with a child with significant disabilities and they're still dealing with worse outcomes, right? Um, More questions? Okay, so most people think I have a question for you here. It's, it's interesting to see yesterday, I was talking to a team in Ireland and the pediatric radiologist was saying, well, you know, and she was an extremely good pediatric radiologist, I don't find that I get anything more from the MRI than I get from the ultrasounds. And I'm curious what you say to people like that. So uh, I think I just say, well, the data has been systematically looked at by a number of investigators for the preterm to show that, uh, and we know that ultrasound is very limited at detecting two major forms of brain injury. It's good for hemorrhage. But even then in the cerebellar hemorrhage, it's only good for the very severe forms. But for white matter injury, it's poor. And for hemorrhage in the cerebellum that's anything other than large, it's poor. So you really are extremely limited and you really don't get the information, particularly at term equivalent in terms of myelination and the posterior limb of the internal capsule, in terms of the integrity of the white matter and in terms of, for me, gyral folding and brain growth. Um, because those really start to talk to, I mean, I almost, uh, Alan, you know, the last bad, really bad temporal lobe I had was a mother who had a lot of challenges. who hadn't been able to visit her baby for two months. That baby hadn't really been held or had any input. And this temporal lobe just looked like the saddest temporal lobe I'd seen in a long time. And that baby's going to need a lot of help when they get home, but in a different domain to like the first baby we looked at with the punctate white matter lesion, who's a, you know, had great temporal lobes, but was more concerned. But if we could find a way where there was a quick processing, post-processing pipeline that says, you know, red for motor, orange for regulation and attention and, and green for cognition or something, or, you know, here's, Here's the, and it's never perfect. You know, as I said, my PCP might estimate my cardiac risk being extraordinarily low, but I might be that 2%. You know, I might have a heart attack tomorrow, you know, and nothing's perfect. And why is she doing it? Is there any data to show that using that score and making her therapeutic decisions is going to actually affect my risk for cardiac? Probably not, but no one's going to question it. We just feel good. Oh, so, you know, I don't know why. I, I think my gut feeling is it speaks a lot more about what we're afraid of. We're afraid that we don't understand. The radiologist is afraid that he's going to be asked what this means and he doesn't know what it means. The neonatologist is afraid of the brain completely. And, uh, and the, and they fear that the parents will be afraid and they don't want to face their fears. And so it's just a whole bundle of confounded fears that no one wants to talk about. Great. Well, thank you, Terry. It's so wonderful to hear you. Any other um, questions before we let Terry go? I know we're past time, but I just want to give anybody a chance. <laughs> 
I'm just very grateful for all of you that are on the line and, and for your passion and your dedication to understanding brain development and being able to better delineate how to help um, because the tools you have can inform what we're doing and uh, they can be used to tell us what we're doing is helping or hurting. And, you know, yes, on an individual baby point of view, they may help us to delineate risk and then to target rehabilitation. But, but without your tools, we'll be lost because the babies can't tell us very easily. And, you know, what, what the tools can do is track, you know, if we're going to randomize to a certain type of intervention, does that make a difference? So keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Terry. And I look forward to developing even more collaborations and collaborative projects. This has been wonderful. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.